number of times. The church is cycling. It's there because it is so powerful. And this is a lesson for us. We have to pay attention to every part and every piece of what the Lord does because everything that the Lord does matters. Everything that is brought out in Scripture or teaches us, it's there for our instruction. It's there to help us to understand better how to live in our own lives. And so let's look at it a little closer today, and then we'll touch a little bit on St. Paul's words as he encourages us as well. So Jesus, of course, is typically sailing in different places. You know that Jesus went in a boat a lot. He liked to ride in a boat. That was the main way to get around uh, Galilee, because Galilee was a giant lake. It was like a lake, uh, not as big as Lake Erie, uh, but probably uh, about the size of like, um, maybe Pomatuni Lake, a little bit bigger than Pomatuni wide, but about that size, a pretty good sized lake. And storms could blow up on it very easily and quickly as well. And we hear Jesus being in storms on the water, that's why. Because all the cities were around the Sea of Galilee. And so Capernaum, where he was from, and many of the other cities were all right on the coastline because they were fishermen, these were fishing communities, and these were people who lived off the land in that way. And so we even see in this story today how the, uh, the uh, swine, the pigs, ran down the hill and into the water and died. So that was likely the um, Lake of Galilee. So Jesus traveled around a lot, and that's what, how it begins, that he uh, sailed to the country of the Gadarenes. And the Gadarenes are interesting because they are uh, Samaritans. They are people who really had conflict with the, uh, the Jewish, you know, uh, things that were the norm, and they sort of were an option, a sect, you might say, a heretical group, you might say, of the, uh, of the Jews. And one of the things that's obvious about it is that there's a herd of pigs. We know that the Jews were forbidden to eat uh, swine uh, of any sort, and so to have a herd of pigs would have been not a good thing, okay? That would have been against the law, you might say, in those days, right? It was against the law to uh, eat pork, right? How many of you like pork? I, I love pork, right? And now we eat pork because of the reason why God changed everything when Christ died and rose again and gave us a new law, a new commandment. Yeah, uh, I do too. It's, it's great for sure. So he steps out onto the land and immediately as soon as he gets out of the boat, this guy comes rushing at him. And he's got broken chains on his arms and he's like mostly naked and he's probably dirty and he's got long hair and scraggly and he's kind of acting really strange and he comes running at Jesus and Jesus immediately commands the demon to come out of him. And then we get, and we see this uh, this dialogue between Jesus and this this man who we might say was just like a crazy homeless guy, right, or somebody who was just insane and they were out of their minds, and and that's how he was acting, okay? Because as we learn about the man, what happened to him? He said he wore no clothes and lived, didn't live in a house, but he lived in the tombs. In those days, when they would bury people, they would bury them in a big cave or underground somewhere. So he was living underground where all the, uh, the dead people were. No one wanted him in the town. They had driven him out because he was acting so strange. You know, he was hurting people and he would get violent. And so they chained him up and put him like out in the woods, in this, in this tomb. And when he saw Jesus, he had broken away from his tombs, his chains, of course, and saw Jesus and was running to him. And he asked Jesus this question. Right as these demons were, were coming out of him, he said, "What?" Or right before that, he said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. And Jesus, uh, he thought he was going to torment this man, right? But Jesus doesn't. He commanded the unclean spirits to come out of the man. For it had often seized him, it said, threw him into the water. And chained him and shackled him. Jesus asked him in this conversation, What is your name? And he said, Legion, 
because many demons had entered inside of this man. Not just one demon, but many demons. He was very tormented. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Here we see Jesus having this dialogue with demons. Isn't this interesting? That the Lord himself, because he knows these evil angels, he can speak directly to them, and they can speak to him too. They can talk to Jesus, and Jesus talks to them. And usually he does not have good things to say to them. <laughs> he tells them to depart or to leave. Because usually what are the demons doing? Almost every case in Scripture, what are the demons doing? They're attacking human beings, right? Because they don't like us. The demons, the fallen angels, do not like us. And so they come after us and they attack us. And you all have experienced these attacks. Maybe not like this, right? Maybe you're not like the Legion guy, right? But you've definitely experienced being attacked by the demons. Because they attack our thoughts. Sometimes they trick us and try to get us to think of things that we shouldn't think of. Or get our minds onto something that would distract us from focusing and thinking about the things of God. So the demons are very subtle. In Jesus' day, they would attack human beings like this and fill them up. Today we don't see this too often because they're much more subtle and quiet and sneaky. Right? They want to sneak around and, and trick us in that way. And so in that way, we also have to focus and look at this. We want to be free, too, of even our tricky thoughts. We don't want the devil to attack us in that way either. Because we all know that whatever you think, how you think becomes, drops down into your heart and begins to be the way you act, right? You guys know how it is. Have you ever been in a bad mood? How many of you have ever been in a bad mood? Been in a bad mood. If you've ever been in a bad mood, you know what it can do. Not only does a bad mood affect you, who else does it affect? Everybody around you, doesn't it? And usually bad moods come about because of some thought that you're having in your mind about the way you feel. Maybe you've got a sore, you know, shoulder, or you're you got eight bones, or maybe you're finances are down the tubes, or maybe you lost your job, or I don't know. Maybe you stubbed your toe. I don't know. It could be anything, right? Something can affect you. You get into a bad mood, and suddenly that changes everybody around you. This is what Jesus does today. Jesus gets off the boat, and he changes everything around him. Jesus didn't come there with a bad mood, did he? The man out of the tombs, he was in a bad mood, you might say. A real bad mood. But the Lord wanted to change that. But Jesus' very presence changes that, brothers and sisters. When you guys gather together to hear as the assembly of the Holy Church, the energy that we have together changes the world. I read recently a saint, a saint quote that said, if just one person in your family is faithful to prayer, it will be the one thing that your family will be able to cling to through the rest of its generations. One person who just commits themselves to pray and to be faithful to God. Yesterday we buried our dear sister Alice, who usually sits right beside Genevieve. And Alice was a model of dedication. She was a model of faithfulness. She was a model of humility. She did not seek her own. When people would snap or get angry at her, she would just politely walk away. And busy herself about something else. A gentle spirit. Someone who, honestly for us, is really an example of a saint because of her humility and her dedication. This is what we need, brothers and sisters, in our world. We need Jesus to come in and not just transform space, but transform our minds. 
St. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you be transformed in your mind, he says. Change in your mind. St. Paul did not want to be a slave to anything. He gave himself fully to Christ, knowing that Christ was even above the law of the Jews. He would have been condemned, certainly, for even going near the Gadarenes, because Jews were supposed to go around and not go there. But St. Paul changes it as well in his teachings. And he says, we're no longer stuck on the law anymore. It's not about whether you eat pork or not. That's not what matters now. What matters now is whether or not you crucify yourself to Christ and Christ to you. You become Christ. For he says, For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. You're not living to the law. You're living to Christ himself who is the fulfillment and completion of the whole law. And then this great verse, which I would encourage all of you to memorize. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. See what happens at the end to the man, right? The man at the end of our gospel. So, the whole multitude came and were upset and angry at Jesus and told Jesus to leave because all their pigs drowned. <laughs> and they were upset because they were actually afraid of Jesus because of what he did to this man in freeing him. Everybody thought, what in the world can he do if he can do that? And they asked him to leave their area. He got into the boat and returned. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return to your house and tell what great things God has done for you. And really this is how we have to act. We have to take what Christ has done for us and make it manifest in our own lives, in our families, in our jobs, in everything that we do, we have to allow Christ to permeate our lives and our very being. And it's not easy. It takes work. Just like being married takes work. Or having a good friendship takes work. You have to work at it. This is how it is with God. We have to work at it. And we have to want to be in love with Christ. If you don't want to be in love with Him, then it will be very hard. This man fell in love with Christ immediately after his change, his transformation. He became a new man. I want to follow you, Lord. He went back and witnessed to his own family and lived a life of love. And a life not of the law, but of dedication to Christ. So let's let Christ be in us. Let's be crucified with Christ. Let's let him live in us and through us into the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.